I'm missing, that was one number that was given in Cashmere. But, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about fatalities in this conflict and that conflict, but I, what, what is the number of people who have lost their lives through, through the Indian occupation? The certain number is 70,000. Uh, since 1989. Uh, many hundreds of thousands have been displaced. Um, 8,000 is the minimum number that have gone missing. Uh, again, I hate to use such a redundant word as brutal because all occupations are brutal. It's like a fatal murder, you know. But this is a particularly nasty uh, occupation. And it's interesting also to examine the troops that the Indian Army uh, sends to Kashmir because they invariably come from other oppressed groups, uh, most notably from the Naga group in the northeast, from Nagaland, or, or from uh, Jharkhand and these other areas where they're you know, extreme poverty. Uh, they're recruited and they're sent then to oppress the Kashmiris. And that's, you know, like uh, very typical of colonial uh, regimes. India is not an external colonial power. It's an internal colonial state. It has not yet graduated to external imperialisms. It is internally imperial. It is imposing its will on its population, populations that don't necessarily want to be part of the Indian Union or certainly want to change the structures of the Indian Union. That is one of the uh, arguments uh, advanced by New Delhi to justify its you know, perpetual occupation. Um, of all of the resistance groups in India, it's only in the northeast, in that Manipur, Nagaland, Assam area, where there is an independence movement. The other militancies are all about changing the structure of the Indian government, not breaking away from India. So is that... Could that happen? It's, you know, it's counterfactual. I mean, it's, it's speculation. We don't know uh, if that, in, in fact, that domino effect will occur. Uh, the domino effect was used to great effect uh, by Eisenhower uh, in the 1950s to justify U.S. military intervention in uh, Indochina. If Vietnam were lost, Thailand will fall, Indonesia will fall, and pretty soon they'll be in San Francisco. Johnson took it to San Francisco a few years later, that analogy. The other argument that India makes, which is incredibly cynical, is um, India has about uh, 200 million Muslims living in, lo let's say, non-Kashmir India. It's one of the largest Muslim populations in the world after neighboring Pakistan, after Bangladesh, after Indonesia. So even it's, it's much bigger than Egypt. It's almost three times the size of, uh, twice, more than twice the size of Egypt, which is the most populous uh, Arab Muslim country. It's, it's much bigger than Iran. It's much bigger than Turkey. So what they are saying, there's been a rise of Hindu nationalism uh, in India. It's called Hindutva. Uh, that has been stoked by you know, various uh, forces. And they're saying that this 200 million minority in India risk backlash from the Hindu nationalist forces if Kashmir achieves uh, breakaway status, that there will be massacres. Imagine that. They're even acknowledging the fact that there is such toxicity in, in the society, in the, in the political structures, that you know, they, they're putting that out there, that there could be mass murder of the 200 million Muslims because the Hindu nationalists, you know, don't want to let go of uh, Kashmir. I know this is not the most uh, thrilling topic, you know, to talk about and, you know, maybe, you'd, maybe we, should have had, we should have had some sitar music uh, and, and uh, you know, some samosas and chapatis. 
it doesn't fit in the overhead anymore, you know? That's the problem. But... Uh, Consolidation of political and economic power into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Um, the, the the vast gap between wealth and poverty in India, between the ability to have a political voice and to have no voice, um, is is rather significant. But it seems like it's a good place to kind of look at some of these larger global. Well, elections in and of themselves are not proof of democracy. A democracy has to have much more content than you know showing up and voting for this or that candidate. And so in states where there have been elections, you'll notice that uh, Washington ad adopts a very hands-off policy, basically, uh, because they're nominal democracies. But if democratic, if there's no economic justice, if there is uh, you know, all kinds of inequities, as we see here in, in the United States, giving rise to the uh, Occupy uh, movement, uh, then I think you know, elections, are, I think they're way overrated. You know, it's a mechanism. OK, it's nice to have elections. But uh, you know, the essence of democracy has to be much more people participation in decision making, which is totally lacking there and basically here. So in that way, the world's largest democracy and the world's second largest democracy have something uh, in common. Can so, I make a couple of comments? Uh, speak up. Yeah. <clears throat> so I just wanted to say a couple of things. First, thank uh, uh, Barbara and Brian for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here because David is one of my heroes. I've admired him for many years because he's written about some of the uh, people that I've followed, like uh, Edward Said and Iqbal Ahmed and others. I wanted to mention some things uh, just so for interest. Uh, this is the part of Kashmir. Just about here, I did a medical camp last year in a little town called Thermic. It's just one of the most beautiful and peaceful places you can be in spite of all the things that you described in the orange part, the green part that I was in was the most beautiful thing you can experience. I intend to go back in June, and if anybody's interested, welcome. That's the same area that many of you have read the book Three Cups of Tea by Greg Mortensen, that he has been, he started from Skardu right here and has opened 80 schools for girls in that part of Kashmir. So it's something that all of you would be familiar with, in spite of what recent articles about Greg Mortensen have said. I think he did make a difference, and he did a very good job. I wanted to address one other thing that uh, David said about internal imperialism. That's the first time I've heard this description. Um, I've heard it differently. You know that India was ruled by the British for 200 years, 150 years. So they had the rulers were called Sahib. Sahib is a term for Mister. Um, and now people in India and Pakistan say that all this change from independence is that the white Sahib has been replaced by the brown Sahib. They haven't really given up that imperialistic attitude. Now it's just the a minority of uh, people who are controlling the bureaucracy and the country rule over their subjects just the same as the British did before. So it's a very interesting uh, presentation that you made. Maybe I, I enjoyed the presentation very much, and I thank everybody for listening to me. Did you say the Tamil Tigers? Yes. Tamil Tigers. Yes. Okay. My second question, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to tell you all my questions first and then maybe last question. <laughs> my second question is about modernization of India, which, uh, which happened in the 2000s, I believe. Um, and do you think it, it, it affected in any way uh, the connection or the relationship? 
Um, what what happened in 2000? Modernization. Modernization. Uh, the the neoliberal agenda is introduced in into India by the current prime minister, Manmohan Singh, who was the finance minister in the early 1990s under Narasimhan Rao. Uh, he um, accepted the globalization model, that is to say privatization of the private sector, uh, cutting of the social safety net programs of social welfare programs, uh, and as we have seen uh, elsewhere. So that was in the early 1990s that, and India opened itself up. It had been notorious for being difficult to invest in because there had been protectionism, tariffs to protect uh, Indian industries and Indian manufacturers, and crucially, Indian agriculture. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the end of this answer uh, because it has been a catastrophe uh, in the countryside uh, in India as there has been a similar catastrophe in uh, Mexico for largely uh, the same reasons. Uh, the uh, Manmohan Singh then you know, introduced this liberal agenda. Uh, it produced and it has produced what Thomas Friedman constantly talks about, this wonderful middle class that drives a car uh, in India and speaks English uh, and has you know, flat screen TVs and uh, he loves to talk with them and uh, he is, this is the India uh, that he knows. What he knows about India could fit in a thimble, uh, I think, and that may be unfair to the thimble. Uh, uh, he, he's hugely overrated. I mean, there's, I could just go on and on about uh, Friedman, uh, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, but let's leave him aside because he's too easy of a target. <laughs> it's not worth even talking uh, about it. I'm sorry. Uh, so this middle class has grown. Uh, they, they have malls. Uh, if you go to Delhi or Mumbai or Calcutta, you go into these incredible malls. You're in another universe, not another country. You're in another universe. Air-conditioned malls, such as one I was in February, in a place called Vasant Kunj, right outside of uh, uh, Delhi. There's, what are the shops there? I'm not kidding you. Gucci, Armani, Versace, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, you know, Patek Philippe watches, Rolex, on and on and on. Just rows of these shops, uh, and across the street, or not very far away, uh, is, you know, indescribable slums. Again, slums is not a word that describes what actually happens in, in South Asia. So globalization has enriched a small group of people in India. Uh, there's always been a, a kind of ruling class there, uh, the Burlas, the Tatas, and other uh, you know, major uh, industrialists, captains of industry, as they would uh, call themselves. Uh, but the rest of the country, surprise, surprise, has been left behind, very much like here. When the, when the, the income and uh, wealth inequality skyrockets in the 1980s under Reagan, his, his economic policies, and we've seen that, you know, that trajectory has just gone uh, through the stratosphere, uh, and it's very parallel. India a little bit later, because they, they started, you know, in, in the... Uh, 1990s. So that's the neoliberal embrace that uh, India is in uh, right now. And in the agricultural sector, which I you know, wanted to mention, uh, India has opened itself up to Monsanto and Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland and all the big grain manufacturers uh, to import uh, their wheat and subsidized by us because I know you know we're so generous. American people want to subsidize profits so that cargo can generate more profits to again give to its shareholders. That's you know really existing capitalism uh, actually has huge components of socialism as as part of it. I know I'm getting off off uh, message here, but uh, what is it? What's happened? What's been the impact on the Indian farmer? They cannot compete at the prices of this imported wheat and um, uh, corn, in the case of Mexico, and uh, rice. 250,000 farmers have committed suicide in India in the last few years. 
I mean, that, that's not a small number of people because they go into debt, they can't compete in the marketplace with the subsidized US uh, grains that are coming in. And this is what happens. I mean, this is an ongoing uh, 250,000 farmers have killed themselves. Uh, there's a very good documentary on this called uh, Nero's, uh, Nero's Tomb, I believe is, is the name of it. I think if you Google it, Nero's, thank you, Nero's Ghost, that's it, Nero's Ghost. Uh, very well you know, documented film, features Vandana Shiva and others uh, who talk about what's happened uh, in the countryside. Now the question about the Tamil Tigers, uh, do they somehow connect or involve with Kashmir? The short answer is no, not at all. They were down here, uh, they were seeking autonomy for the Tamil people who are in great numbers in this part of India and here in the northern part of uh, Sri Lanka. Rafiq, you had your hand up? Oh, no, I was just pointing to a... Okay. I, I, do, I, I do have a question, and it's uh, maybe a very scary moment. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it'll, come, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. Okay. Someone else? <laughs> Taslim? I just wanted to... Okay. Nothing. You mentioned that we had uh, some video from Sanjay Khan. Yes, uh, Brian is going to show that, I think, at some point. You made a very interesting comment about the uh, dumping of cheap wheat, rice, and soybean and corn. Last year, the UNICEF refused to accept $50 million in aid from the U.S. government because it came in the form of corn. Because if they dumped the corn in West Africa, where it was intended to go, the farmers would be ruined. So exactly the same reason you said. Mm -hmm. So do you have a feeling you can express to us why you were banned from commercial grain? It probably has to do with Kashmir, because that's their solar plexus. That's their visceral that's their existential threat to their very existence. Uh, Kashmir to India is what uh, Tibet is to China. As soon as you even just say the word Tibet to, I mean, the Chinese government, they go ballistic, and they have a completely irrational uh, response. So I think it, it's largely because of that that the graves have now been confirmed. You see, we knew about these graves two years ago when. Uh, an Indian-based human rights group in collaboration with some people here in the United States, including Angana uh, Chatterjee, uh, issued a report called Buried Evidence. I was there when it was issued, uh, saying that you know, all of these graves have been identified, uh, have been uncovered, forensics uh, examination has taken place. It, they these examinations indicate that these people were shot at close range. In other words, they were executed uh, and or they exhibited uh, signs of torture and that there were all these graves. Now, that was kind of dismissed and ignored. As far as I know, there was no reporting on that anywhere in the uh, US press uh, because it was done by this you know, suspect group which had an agenda, you know, which could have been even called anti-Indian the way they use anti-American here. Uh, so what happened? The state of Jammu and Kashmir was under such pressure that they, have, they appointed their own Human Rights Commission to investigate this issue of the unmarked graves. They basically confirmed everything that was revealed two years ago in the buried evidence report. So this is, maybe we should cut the lights. Uh, do you need me? No. These are just a few. Some kind of jihadi. Uh, and the whole thing is staged. And this, this is a widespread practice. And they use that term uh, encounter. I don't know if it's is it. It's used in Pakistan also, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> this is one of the places I've been there a couple of times. Uh, I've I've been to to Kapwar. This the, these graves were uncovered before these well documented reports that I referred to that have come out in the last year and two years, where thousands of graves have been uncovered. This is just a couple that they found. Uh, a question about the economy and uh, how did it fare with the, with the international you know, meltdown and economic uh, 
Well, tourism is off, obviously, uh, but according to the New York Times, uh, I couldn't verify this, uh, domestic Indian tourism picked up in this past summer. Uh, Kashmir exports its fruits, its uh, well-known carpets, you know, to other parts of the world. Um, there is a huge expatriate Kashmiri community, um, particularly in England, uh, and so a lot of remittances are sent home. So there's that source of uh, income as well. I suspect those remittances have declined because of you know the economic problems, particularly in in uh, in Britain, but it's uh, they're largely self-sustaining. Uh, they have enough rice there. There's enough fruit there. Uh, they don't need a lot of things. You know, there's goats everywhere you look. Uh, there's cattle, so they they have enough dairy products. They have enough rice. Uh, they have enough uh, fruit to sustain themselves. It's a very small population. You know, six seven million. Yes. I, think, uh, well, I want to refer back to your comment, the gentleman from Eric. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. I just thought it was great. You dropped some information about some work you were doing. I didn't quite understand, but it sounded quite wonderful. Did, were you talking about it? I, I just didn't hear the whole. A medical camp, I guess. A medical camp. A me that's what I thought. No. And you were saying he was uh, possibly be interested in what you were doing or joining or, or being part of If you want to tour. The area in which you are in is? It was part of Kashmir, but okay. it's called, in, in now it's that part is called Gilgit, G-I-L. It's about 150 kilometers from the base camp of K2 mountain, which is the second highest peak in the world. Uh, it sounds very wonderful. Isn't it? It's a gorgeous place, yeah. yeah. So I think... Some final words. Well, let me wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. Don't forget, Deep Dish TV. Be as generous as you possibly uh, can be. It's a. I mean, it's it's almost pathetic that we have to do these kinds of things, but it's a great excuse to get together. You know, in a, a more rational, sane society, these independent media organizations would be well funded. We wouldn't be groveling for money. But we're not in that society. It's something to imagine. You know, as as they say in the World Social Forum about you know another world is possible. We can perhaps we can go toward that, but we need to uh, support uh, Deep Dish TV. And uh, I didn't mention that if you want to know more about Kashmir, uh, there are four CDs, alternative radio CDs, specifically about uh, Kashmir and the issues I talked about. They're out there on the, the table as well. So viva Deep Dish, viva. adelante, Zindabad.